pestilence, war, famine, and death. With the opening of four of the seven seals, out rode an unyielding collection of overpowering forces fixated upon laying waste to the population at large. They were called the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, riding upon galloping beasts with little anyone could do to diminish their onslaught. So much destruction was perpetrated by a literal quartet, providing the exact framework for a professional wrestling syndicate to borrow literally from the mythology. Though Ric Flair and the Squared Circle version of the Four Horsemen did not enter on actual horses, nor did they facilitate global starvation, come to think of it, they did leave a craterous mark on the terrain in which they walked. For the better part of a decade and a half, Flair and his band of brothers did all they could to monopolize the championship scenes of Crockett and Turner-owned promotions, using treachery and the numbers game to divide and conquer to their liking. In all, the Four Horsemen have had 15 official wrestling members as well as a particular manager forever identified with the group. There have been peripheral members through the years, be they Hiro Matsuda, Kendall Windham, or even Bobby Heenan for a night, but this is for the group's legitimate made men. Only truly recognized, patched-in horsemen will make this cut. Mason Ryan, Stevie Ray, Earthquake, Alundra Blaze, Norman Smiley, Zach Gowan, Bam Bam Bigelow. Ahmed Johnson, Tory Wilson, Buff, Bagwell, Robert Gibson, Dave Taylor, Terry Taylor, and Godfather's Homes. Dwayne Gill, Adam Bomb, Michael Hayes, Cor Von, S.A. Rios, Jim and I, the manager from Kai and Ty, Jim Powers, Francine, Jack Swagger, Mean Gene, Fatchick Thriller, Duke the Dumpster, Oklahoma Manta. What happened to that wrestler? Someone main eventing, which leaves me lamenting. What happened to that wrestler? Some since long forgotten, but their memories live on. Lex Luger. We'll save the originals for the end and begin with the 10 men that came along following the original incarnation. And that list begins with the total package, whose chiseled physique provided the horsemen with the literal muscle they needed to properly throw their weight around. In early 1987, the group kicked out veteran Ole Anderson in order to permit rising star Luger entry, though by year's end, Luger himself was aced out of the group due to issues with manager JJ Dillon. Long retired from the ring, Luger recovered from both years of addictions and a life-altering spinal impingement and continues with WWE on their company wellness policy. Barry Windham When Luger waged war with his former horseman teammates, Windham joined his cause and the two even defeated Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard for the tag team titles. Then Windham double-crossed Luger during a title defense, joining the horseman himself in Luger's old spot. At one juncture, Windham completed a golden quartet, holding the US title while Arn and Tully reigned with the tag, and Flair sat upon his kingly perch with the world title. Now in his late 50s, Windham, who happens to be an uncle to a certain fiend, owns and operates a home and business inspection company in Brooksville, Florida. Sting after a long period of dormancy, the Horsemen reformed in late 1989 as a babyface faction, with mega popular Sting a startling choice for a Flair disciple. This didn't last as Sting made a sportsmanlike challenge to Flair for his world title, and the group kicked him out, turning themselves heel in the process. The Stinger gained his revenge that summer at Great American Bash, dramatically slaying Flair in front of a wild Baltimore crowd to capture the title. Retired since wrestling for the WWE title in 2015, a sentence many thought would never be uttered, Sting remains with the company on a Legends deal, still making guest appearances. Sid Vicious The heel version of the group filled itself out in the spring of 1990 by welcoming Wyndham back into the fold, and shortly thereafter adding the ultimate roadblock in the mighty Sid. Once Sting became champion after defeating Flair, Sid stepped up to the plate as one of his first challengers, nearly winning the belt under dubious circumstances at the 1990 Halloween Havoc, with the help of Wyndham dressed as Sting. It was a mess, don't ask. Only wrestling on occasion since his infamous 2001 leg break, Sid wrestled the final match of his career in 2017, winning a short match for Canada's Great North Wrestling. Paul Roma. 
No induction into the Four Horsemen was as controversial as the addition of former WWE enhancement talent turned mid-card tag team wrestler Paul Roma. Though Roma was always an underrated athlete with a good look and perhaps deserved a little more than his lower card designation, said designation failed to add prestige to a group that prided itself on top shelf flavor. And sentiment toward Roma as a horseman has not cooled off in the years since. Now retired from the ring for over 20 years, these days Roma is an instructor at Paradise Alley Wrestling School in East Haven, Connecticut. Brian Pillman the 1995 revival of the group netted Flair a couple more world title reigns, but didn't quite match the overall ecstasy of gold that had been their hallmark 10 years earlier. This new horseman did, however, allow two talented young wrestlers to carve out interesting niches, namely an increasingly unhinged Pillman. Flying Brian's manic madness could not have been scripted, even if his work slash shoot exit from WCW in early 1996 was in fact planned out, perhaps too well planned out. Sadly, Pillman passed away in October 1997 of heart disease at the age of 35. His legacy lives on through son Brian Jr., who has wrestled for both MLW and AEW. Chris Benoit Joining the Pillmanized version of the troupe was the Canadian Crippler, having come into the Horseman with an international reputation for scientific brilliance, as well as the fact that he once broke Sabu's neck. Benoit's attitude didn't seem to fit the glitz and glamour coveted by the classic Horseman, but his hard-nosed competitiveness and relentless ring work made him something of a modernized Anderson relative, capturing the essence of the domineering Horseman spirit. As we all know, the Benoit story did not have a happy ending. After Chris murdered wife Nancy and son Daniel over one June 2007 weekend before hanging himself at the age of 40. Steve McMichael Boy, if you thought Roma was a controversial entry, imagine a time when a 38-year-old ex-NFL lineman with no involvement in wrestling until the previous year was suddenly flanking Flair, Anderson, and Benoit. Mongo was the target of much derision for his greener-than-astroturf wrestling and his nonsensical promos that made the Super Bowl shuffle lyrics sound like Jim Morrison's spoken word. But McMichael did have his charms, because in some ways he actually overachieved. More known for his days as a beloved Chicago Bear, McMichael still associates with the team that he helped lead to victory in Super Bowl XX and recently appeared as part of the centennial celebration for the franchise. Jeff Jarrett As Arn Anderson's career began to wind down by early 1997, a replacement was sought for the coveted enforcer spot, and the first candidate seemed to be horseman applicant Jarrett. In the angle, Flair was Jarrett's only supporter for horseman inclusion, and friction existed in the five months that Double J graced the stable. Though he won the US title while associated with the group, he was nonetheless driven out by the others and feuded with McMichael over the belt. Though he still occasionally wrestles, Jarrett is mostly a behind the scenes presence these days, working for WWE as a backstage producer. Kurt Hennig A former Flair ally in WWE as Mr. Perfect just a few years earlier, Hennig joined WCW in 1997 and seemed a logical and appropriate fit to be the new enforcer for the group. When Arn Anderson officially retired in a genuinely heart-wrenching moment that August, he bestowed his spot upon Hennig, a scene that would have been genuinely touching and memorable had Hennig not double-crossed the Horsemen in war games three weeks later in order to join the New World Order. Sadly, the famed father of Curtis Axel passed away in February 2003 of a cocaine overdose at just 44 years of age. Dean Malenko one year after the Horseman disbanded, Malenko lobbied to reunite whatever parts of the group he could. He won support from Benoit, who along with the help of old manager JJ Dillon, got Anderson to help reform the legendary collective. This was capped off by the emotionally charged return of Flair after five months of Eric Bischoff-driven exile, the same night that Malenko himself was confirmed as a Horseman and the final official new member of the group. After 18 years as a backstage agent in WWE, Malenko parted ways with the company in 2019, joining All Elite Wrestling as a senior producer. JJ Dillon As a manager, Dillon seemed an ideal fit for the Horsemen, bringing an aura of snooty privilege to the proceedings, enhancing the group's villainous standing by being 
being a composite of every princely businessman seen in film and TV. He also wasn't above taking an ass kicking as a veteran wrestler in his own right. The likes of Dusty Rhodes, The Road Warriors, and others would tee off on Dylan whenever possible, and he's truly one of the greatest managers there ever was. Now 77 years old, Dylan still makes appearances at various conventions and fan fests, and through 2018, co hosted the JJ Dylan Show podcast with MLW announcer Rich Bokini. Tully Blanchard Blanchard was one of those guys who could under no circumstances ever truly be a babyface. His flagrant cockiness, boisterous demeanor, and the pronounced way he would strut around the ring made him a perfect villain, a product of the territory days that would be an utter revelation in this day and age. In all, Blanchard held the United States, television, world tag team, and national heavyweight titles in his time as a horseman, while also feuding famously with the likes of Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA. Now a minister, the father of Tessa Blanchard serves on the board of advisors for the International Network of Prison Ministries, and recently turned up in AEW to aid Sean Spears in his rivalry with Cody Rhodes, because Tully hates anybody named Rhodes. Ole Anderson the gruff and grizzled Ole Anderson has been retired from the ring since 1990, and shortly thereafter fell out of the spotlight as an on-camera personality, but he'll forever be identified as one of the founding fathers of what is perhaps wrestling's greatest stable. In his time with the group, Ole held the NWA national tag team titles alongside Arn, his kayfabe brother or nephew depending on the day, and ran much interference on Flair's behalf. Largely out of the spotlight these days, Ole is now in his late 70s and is reported to have been suffering from multiple sclerosis for some time. Arn Anderson Any horseman incarnation comes equipped with two men at all times, charismatic wild man Flair and the gritty and stoic Anderson. Never one to avoid getting dirt under his nails, Double A flanked his old buddy Nate at every turn, doling out sneak attacks for the greater good and rattling opponents with his thunderous spinebuster, one that nobody ever did better. While Flair spellbound audiences with his over-the-top promos, it was Anderson who spoke just as magnetically about pride among thieves and courage among crooks. Under the Horseman banner, the Enforcer held five tag team titles on five separate occasions with Ole and Tully, and was also a four-time television champion. Recently let go after 18 years as a WWE producer, Anderson popped up at AEW's All Out and has started a podcast with Conrad Thompson. Ric Flair Last but certainly not least, we come to the godfather of the horseman, the nature boy himself. In chess, you protected the king, and Flair was the gold-wearing king of this castle, relying on his brothers-in-arms to help ward off all challenges to his coveted world title. Eight of Flair's 16 official world title reigns came while the horsemen were in business, with challengers the likes of Dusty Rhodes, Lex Luger, Sting, Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, and others tasked with taking down the face of the operation. But on many occasions, Slick Rick was just slick enough to escape his ordained fate. Now 70 years old, Flair hasn't wrestled for close to a decade, but remains a seminal and beloved pop culture figure. His legacy is carried on by daughter Charlotte, and he's still apt to appear on legend-themed WWE programming, where a chorus of woos always awaits him. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments down below. You can follow us on Twitter at Cultaholic. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do here at Cultaholic, you can pledge to us on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And most importantly, don't forget to hit subscribe and join us.